Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, welcome to the next edition of 2TG's uh, Employment Monthly. Uh, I'm Benjamin Phelps, and I'm going to be uh, talking today about jurisdiction uh, in employment claims. The question of jurisdiction in employment matters is uh, a difficult and fascinating area. Uh, it certainly doesn't come up uh, every day, uh, but when it does come up, it's useful to have an overview of the sorts of questions and issues that are involved and where one might look uh, for the answers. Before we get into the meat of today's talk, however, uh, we need to talk about terminology first. Uh, and that's because uh, the term jurisdiction is used in a variety of different contexts in employment litigation, and in each context, it has a distinct meaning. Uh, the first uh, context uh, refers to the circumstances in which an English court or tribunal uh, will accept jurisdiction over a claim with an ostensibly international element, as opposed to requiring that the claim be heard in a foreign court. This will be referred to as international jurisdiction. It is a question of uh, private international law uh, and the application of rules to demonstrate a sufficiency of connection between the dispute and the forum such as to uh, facilitate the forum to take jurisdiction on grounds of comity and practicality. The second uh, context is uh, referred to as domestic jurisdiction. And these are purely internal questions about the allocation of work between the different courts and tribunals within the UK. For instance, what matters can be heard in the High Court and what matters must be ventilated in the Employment Tribunal. Thirdly, we have a scenario often termed as a jurisdictional issue, but in reality, not a jurisdictional question at all. And that is the question of the territorial scope of uh, Great British uh, employment legislation. For instance, the right against unfair dismissal, when that is applied in an international context, which claimants benefit uh, from the uh, right against unfair dismissal. Now, I say that that's often termed a jurisdictional issue, and that is because you often see uh, judges, when they reject the contention that an a claimant has fallen within the ambit of the relevant uh, employment statute, holding that they have no jurisdiction, when what they really mean, in my submission, is that uh, the claimant doesn't fall within the territorial scope of the relevant legislation. So with that terminology in mind, we can turn to what this talk is about and what we are going to discuss today. Uh, there are three topics. First, we are going to look at employment tribunals, and there are two subcategories within that. Uh, we are going to look at the uh, employment tribunal rules of international jurisdiction, and then we will look at uh, the proper approach to determine questions of the territorial scope of employment legislation. And then we will look in respect of non-employment tribunal claims at the jurisdiction landscape post uh, Brexit and what changes uh, have occurred. Uh, starting then with the jurisdiction position in the employment tribunal, uh, the starting point of course is that the employment tribunals are a creature of statute. The consequence of that is they have no inherent jurisdiction. Any jurisdiction they have is determined by the Employment Tribunal rules. Uh, that provision is currently to be found in Rule 8 of the Employment Tribunal rules, uh, which sets out a fourfold uh, scenarios in which jurisdiction might be established. The first, Rule 8a, looks to the uh, where the respondent or one of the respondents resides or carries on business. The second looks to where the acts and omissions complained of took place. The third looks to uh, the contract under which the work was done. And the fourth looks to, uh, generally, the sufficiency of connection. Taken together, these four aspects provide for a very broad international jurisdiction. That point might be made with reference to Rule 8a. Consider a uh, foreign domiciled claimant who sues a variety of foreign domiciled respondents but one of those respondents happens to be uh, resident in England and Wales. In that scenario, you have a, a, a dispute that's ostensibly got very little connection uh, to uh, the tribunals of England, but would satisfy um, Gateway 8A. 
It's for that reason that we uh, often uh, debate uh, questions of territorial scope as being the linchpin of the discretion over which international disputes are heard in employment tribunals, rather than questions of whether or not Rule 8 is satisfied or not. The breadth of that potential jurisdiction is one of the factors that has uh, caused some commentators, including Paul Nichols QC in his book, Employment uh, and Commercial Disputes, to suggest that Rule 8 isn't actually a source of jurisdiction at all, but rather a purely uh, administrative rule that assumes pre-existent jurisdiction to be derived from other sources. Um, it's a very interesting argument and merits reading. One of the issues, however, that one's encounters is that if one dismisses Rule 8 as a source of jurisdiction itself, it becomes very difficult to um, identify potential other sources of jurisdiction for the employment tribunals, especially uh, post-Brexit and the Brussels One regulation recast ceasing to apply. Other commentators, including Louise Merritt and Harvey, uh, accept that Rule 8 is, uh, in fact, the source of jurisdiction, uh, international jurisdiction for the employment tribunals. But it's certainly an interesting argument if one wants to look into it further. Um, we turn then to our second topic, which is the question of the territorial scope of legislation. Now, um, in practice, the limitations imposed by the territorial scope of legislation somewhat mitigate the breadth of jurisdiction available under um, Rule 8 of the Employment Tribunal Rules. Now, as I've said, this isn't really a question of jurisdiction at all, although it's often described as such. Rather, it is simply a question of whether or not the subject matter of a dispute comes within the terms of the relevant employment legislation that one is concerned with. Now, the starting point, of course, is that um, it cannot be intended by the UK Parliament to legislate effectively for worldwide employment rights. Um, when we legislated for the rights against unfair dismissal, we can't have been intended or can't have intended to um, give every person in the world uh, the right against unfair dismissal, regardless of where they work, who they work for. There must therefore be some limit to the extent of that legislation. But uh, fascinatingly, neither the Employment Rights Act nor the Equality Act, two of the most uh, oft cited and used uh, employment rights statutes, actually provide for their own uh, territorial extent and limit their own territorial extent. Uh, that is in contrast to other employment legislation, such as uh, Section 285 of Tarika, which does make provision for its territorial extent. How we then deal with uh, what claimants fall within the ambit of uh, legislation, the territorial limits of employment legislation, has been developed across a series of cases, uh, starting uh, with uh, Lord Hoffman's famous judgment in Lawson and Serco, and continuing in, in the various cases I've set out at the bottom of the screen, um, uh, bottom of the slide. Um, uh, for today's purposes, we don't need to look at uh, all of those cases, but if one is advising on this issue, one should consider uh, the detail of all of those cases. But we can uh, today look instead to the summary given by Lord Justice Underhill in Jeffrey uh, and the British Council. And I've set out uh, relevant parts of the summary uh, on the slide. Um, we look first to uh, the territorial pull of the place of work. The notion that if someone works in a, uh, a foreign country and lives and works in a foreign country, um, they will be subject to the employment law of that country rather than the law of Great Britain. Um, that, however, is not a hard and fast rule. It can be uh, rebutted uh, by uh, exceptional cases uh, where the factors connecting the employment to Great Britain and to British employment law pull sufficiently strongly to outweigh the territorial pull of the place of work. Um, that is referred to as the sufficient question, uh, sufficient connection question. Two such examples, although non-exhaustively, of when that connection might be satisfied uh, are, uh, for instance, posted workers or workers who work abroad in a British enclave. But those are not fixed categories. Rather, it is still a question of the sufficiency uh, of the connection. If one has a worker who is truly expatriate in the sense that they both live and work abroad, then it will be rather more difficult and one will require especially strong factors to overcome the territorial pull of the place of work. 
Now that's a useful source of uh, guidance and we might not need to look much beyond that for the purposes of this uh, shorter webinar. Uh, however, it is not intended to be exhaustive and there are cases which uh, don't fit that guidance. Uh, for instance, an example is in the Bates van Inkelhoff case, which I put on the uh, previous slide, where a, a, a individual was employed by, uh, sorry, a work was a worker for a, um, a UK law firm, uh, but worked the vast majority of their time in Tanzania, uh, but did occasionally work in uh, uh, Great Britain. Now, in that background, they weren't, of course, purely working abroad, and therefore, uh, the starting point wasn't engaged. Rather, uh, they uh, split their time between uh, places and therefore the territorial pull of the place of work couldn't be purely relied on. And the Court of Appeal considered that the effect of that distinction was that um, you did not need pure exceptional circumstances in order to displace the territorial pull of the place of work. Rather, it was purely a question of the sufficiency of connection. Um, a recent example of this exercise actually being carried out comes in the Malumba case, which I put uh, on the uh, slide. Uh, in that case, the claimant, who was a citizen of the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, um, was employed uh, is, as an um, associate um, and was required under that contract, which was subject to, uh, the offer was subject to New York law, or said to be subject to New York law, to work in locations around the world, moving from six months, uh, in six months stints to various places. So they went from America to Switzerland uh, and then uh, to uh, London, uh, and then brought various claims arising out of the termination uh, of uh, her employment uh, there. Now, uh, it's useful for two reasons. First, it shows an analysis of the relevant factors. So identifying, looking at where someone was working at, at different times, looking at where they took instruction from, how they were paid, all the factors that go to exploring the nature of one's connection to uh, British employment law. Uh, it is also an important reminder of the need to look in stages at uh, what the claims brought are and the point at which one might come within the territorial ambit of the legislation. For instance, uh, one might have uh, uh, brought a claim alleging that one had a whistleblower claim during a time in which they were resident uh, in New York, uh, but then subsequently move to uh, London and then bring a further claim. Um, one has to split those claims and look whether at what point one came uh, within the territorial ambit such that maybe the latter claim was permissible, whereas the former claim uh, was not. Uh, lastly, before we move this interest and uh, move on from this interesting topic, um, we have to raise, but not necessarily fully consider, owing to the limitations uh, of uh, the structure of this talk, um, the, uh, uh, um, the situation of um, statutes that are derived from EU directives and the effect that Brexit has on those. Um, those statutes um, had previously uh, been interpreted with reference to the principle of effectiveness. And whether or not uh, which influences their scope and whether or not that holds true post Brexit uh, remains to be the subject of detailed consideration. So pausing for a moment there, we've looked at uh, employment tribunals, the question of international jurisdiction in employment tribunals, and then the more litigated question of the territorial scope of employment legislation that those employment tribunals might be applying. We're now going to leave employment tribunals and move to look at jurisdiction in respect of claims other than those brought in employment tribunals. So the types of claim we're looking at here are uh, common law claims, for instance, looking at uh, those to enforce uh, restrictive covenants, uh, claims in respect of conspiracy or the economic torts, or uh, workplace injuries. Now, prior to Brexit, and the reason Brexit is uh, significant here is there was an instrument called the Brussels One Regulation Recast that was a intra-EU um, a system of rules that allocated jurisdiction between member states. Now, uh, following the end of the transition period, that ceased to apply, uh, and we reverted back to uh, the common law system of jurisdiction with one important modification for employment claims, which I'll come on to. Now, the common law system is based on uh, the fact of service, service on a defendant, and a lawful basis for that service. Um, where a defendant can be served at a place within, a within the jurisdiction, 
the fact of, the, of service on them establishes jurisdiction over that defendant. So it is useful and indeed important to always check whether or not you can serve your defendant at a place within the jurisdiction. Um, however, where a defendant cannot be served within the jurisdiction, uh, it's necessary to apply uh, to serve the claim form on that defendant outside the jurisdiction. Uh, and that application for permission to do so is brought pursuant to CPR 6.36 and 6.37. Um, when one uh, applies for permission to serve out, a claimant has to show in respect of each claim brought uh, a good arguable case that their claim falls within one of the uh, jurisdictional gateways, uh, that their claim has reasonable prospects of success, and that England is the proper place in which to bring the claim or the forum convenience. Uh, factor uh, B is referred to as the merits threshold and is based on the long-standing notion that we will not call the defendant to the jurisdiction to answer a uh, hopeless claim. Factor C um, is an evaluative exercise carried about by the judge to weigh uh, the connection of the forum and the practicality of the trial uh, proceeding here to uh, ascertain whether or not England is indeed the proper place in which to put the claim or whether there is actually some other more appropriate uh, jurisdiction. The first limb, however, refers to a good arguable case that a jurisdictional gateway is satisfied. Now, the jurisdictional gateways are uh, set out in CPR uh, Practice Direction 6B, paragraph 3.1, uh, and are a list of, of scenarios in which the uh, sufficiency of connection is indicated, such as to cast the net wide enough that that dispute might be included. Um, some relevant gateways for employment and business disputes are uh, the gateway in respect of claims and tort, which looks to where damage was uh, sustained or will be sustained. The gateways in respect of contract claims, which look to where the contract was made, whether or not the contract is governed by English law, and whether or not any breach of contract uh, took place uh, within the jurisdiction. And the necessary or proper party gateway, which is a mechanism by which one can add uh, uh, um, additional defendants to a claim proceeding against an anchor defendant, where one has uh, established jurisdiction in respect of the anchor defendant, other than in reliance on the necessary or proper party gateway. Those three make up the sort of bread and butter tools of litigation uh, in this field and uh, a lot of applications of permission to serve out. That framework uh, collectively might be referred to as the uh, service out uh, framework. And going forward, it is the main tool by which in general, people will serve claims and bring foreign defendants within the jurisdiction outside the scope of the international jurisdiction of the employment tribunals. Uh, however, there is an important and interesting uh, development in the field of uh, employment claims specifically, uh, and that is in section 15C of the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Act 1982, which is a new uh, statutory ground of jurisdiction uh, post-Brexit, um, which uh, is designed to resemble Article 21 of the Brussels Regulation Recast. Um, Article 21 is interesting because it's informed and driven by the weaker party rationale uh, in the Brussels jurisprudence. The idea that economically weaker parties should have uh, more favourable grounds uh, of jurisdiction. And uh, Section 15C and indeed Article 21 accomplished that aim by um, restricting the places in which uh, the economically weaker, in general, employee may be sued and providing more generous grounds of jurisdiction for an employee to sue the economically stronger employer. And the way that's accomplished in Section 50C is that in the majority of cases, an employee can sue an employer if that employer is a UK entity in the UK, um, UK employer's domicile, and alternatively, in the part of the UK where the employee habitually carries out their work. In contrast, uh, the employee, uh, if domiciled in the UK, um, it can be sued only by the employer in the place in which the, uh, of the UK in which the employee is domiciled regardless of the domicile of the employer. Now, this regime is mandatory to a certain extent in that one can only contract out of it, um, and this is expressed within the terms of Section 15C, if that contract comes after the dispute has arisen and allows the employee to bring proceedings in course other than indicated in this section.
Now, what's interesting about Section 15C is it is not a jurisdictional gateway. It's not in perhaps Direction 6B. Rather, it is a statutory ground of jurisdiction in Section 15C. So there is no need to seek permission to serve out. You do not need to satisfy, for instance, on that application that the merits test has been satisfied, and you do not need to show that England is the forum convenience. However, it is possible uh, for a defendant potentially to seek a stay of those proceedings on grounds of forum non convenience. So that is how the uh, Bre uh, Brexit has changed the uh, jurisdictional landscape in non employment uh, tribunal claims uh, going forward. Um, it's a combination of reverting to the old uh, with injecting a bit of flair with the new, um, which might stand for some interesting developments uh, down the line. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, listening.